Hello, everyone. We hope everyone's 2018 is off to a great start, and we'd like to thank you all for being here today for our webinar presentation on the affective reflective theory of physical inactivity and exercise. We're delighted today to have our presenters, Dr. Ralph Brand, a professor at the University of Pot Potsdam in Germany, and Dr. Patty Ekakakis, a professor at Iowa State University. Doctors Brand and Ekakakis are well-established leaders in the field of sport and exercise psychology, and both have strong interests in the use of the dual process frameworks, using dual process frameworks to understand and promote physical activity across diverse populations. And that is what brings us here today to our, um, as our presenters will introduce their new theory, the affective reflective theory or art of physical inactivity and exercise. Their publication by the same title was published at the end of 2017 um, in the German Journal of Exercise and Sports Science. And if you're interested in learning more um, about the work presented here today, the citation for that um, publication was presented on the previous screen. Um, and before we get started today, I'd like to take a moment just to give some brief background about the theories and techniques of behavior change interventions SIG webinar series. We aim to hold three of these webinars per academic year, and this is our third webinar of the 2017-2018 academic year. And these webinars are meant to disseminate advances in theories and techniques of behavior change interventions and to facilitate conversations and discussions about emerging issues related to behavior change led by leaders in the field of behavioral medicine. Um, for those of you here today or listening to this recording at a later date, um, the TTBCI SIG is always interested in potential topics for these webinars, so feel free to contact um, any of the individuals listed on the slide here um, with your topics or suggestions. Um, and next, I'd just like to introduce myself and the other individuals that were in instrumental in organizing and executing this webinar. My name is Jacqueline Marr, and I'm a junior co-chair within the TTBCI SIG. I'd also like to thank our TTBCI leadership, not listed on the slide for helping and for their help in organizing this we webinar, um, which would be co-chairs uh, Dr. Austin Baldwin and Dr. Susan Chikowski, and fellow junior co-chairs Dr. Paul Branscom and Lauren Abrams. Um, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Bethany Kwan for volunteering to co-moderate this session today. Today, and I also want to give a special thanks to Ann Hahn of SBM who has done a tremendous amount of work behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. Finishing up with a few housekeeping items, um, please note that all attendees are muted, and if you have any questions, please type them into the questions box, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Please also complete the brief evaluation survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar has ended. Um, also, we will peri periodically have poll questions during today's presentation, and these questions will pop up automatically on your screen, so be on the lookout for them. And then lastly, our TTBCI SIG will be live tweeting today's webinar through SBM's uh, Twitter account, at Behavioral Medicine. Um, if you're tweeting about today's presentation, don't forget to use the hashtag TTBCI SIG or tag SBM in your tweets using their Twitter handle at Behavioral Medicine. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brand, who will kick off today's presentation. Thank you. And uh, hello from Germany. Thank you from my side for uh, getting the having the opportunity to present uh, the work uh, I uh, did together with Paddy Ekikakis. Um, as you see on our first slide, uh, you are awaiting four sections. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, Patty Ekikakis and I uh, <clears throat> decided that I would have to start now with giving you a very brief introduction into dual process theory. Uh, um, we'll learn something about type one and type two processes on a uh, more general level. So this is sort of gray theory before uh, Professor Ekekakis will introduce, uh, uh, sorry, will, in, will introduce uh, you to effective response to exercise 
an effective valuation as a type one process. And you can read, you will read the two remaining sections here under C and D. So um, let's start with section A. Next slide, please. And some background info from where we started thinking about ART, effective reflective theory of physical inactivity of an exercise. Um, most of you who work with clients uh, who do interventions into physical inactivity might be familiar with, with theories of health behavior change and health maintenance. Now, most of the theories you might know right now can be summarized uh, by a few thoughts. We refer to a family of health behavior change theories under the umbrella term of social cognitive theorizing. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Example theories uh, are theory of planned behavior, social learning theory, or self-determination theory. All these social cognitive theories focus on how people reflect on their thoughts and on their feelings. All those theories, or most of these theories, are related to the beliefs people have about their actual state and about the future. So example constructs like outcome expectancy, self-efficacy or self-concordance are health behavior, uh, behavior variables, which all relate to how people reflect about their thoughts and their feelings. Now, effective reflective theory is somewhat different because um, we would like to, or we identify uh, one meta-theoretical background, one concomitant line of thinking which lies behind the social cognitive theories of behavior change. Next slide, please. Most of these theories uh, have one underlying thought, which is that most of the theories assume unbounded rationality in people's behaviors and actions. The concept of unbounded rationality means that most people uh, tacitly assume that humans are rational in their decision making and that they seek for optimal, optimal solutions that uh, human decision makers are rational in a way that they seek for the best solution for certain situations. However, next slide please. It has been suggested that this unbounded rationality is not what we, what we should expect. People often act as satisficers. That is, in many situations, people won't seek for the optimum solution, but rather for a satisfactory, uh, for a satisfactory one. So maybe instead of assuming unbounded rationality in human behavior, it is an alternative or even better to assume bounded rationality, which means that the rationality or that rationality is limited by the availability of information and the tractability of decision problem, as well as by cognitive limitations of mind. In a nutshell, people would not behave, will not behave rational in every situation and all of the time. In many situations, bounded rationality is a more sensible assumption of how 
people choose what they do and what they do not. Next slide, please. I would like to ask you a question now. What is your experience with dual process theories? Did you ever hear about dual process theories or did you work with them? Is there anything you know already about dual process theories? Okay, thanks for your feedback. As I can see, some of you have already learned about what a dual process theories are. Um, some others uh, have not. So let me give you one very, very brief idea about the general framework we're working with before you will learn a lot more about it in the next section. Next slide, please. In fact, there are a lot of different models that can be summarized uh, under the broader idea of what is a dual process theory. But there is one conceptual convention there is one use of terminology which is common to all or almost all different dual process or dual system theories. Most generally, dual process theories assume that there are type one and type two processes. Type one processes and type two processes are defined in a way you can read it on that slide. Most importantly, because this is what's kind of new for dual process theory, is that dual process, uh, process theories assume that type one processes are fast and automatic in a sense that they require little or no cognitive resources and efforts. Whereas type two processes are slower and reflective in a way that they comprise controlled reasoning. So just to give you an orientation, most of the theories you might know about behavior change, and especially the theories I uh, showed you uh, the two slides before, deal with, typically deal with type two psychological processes. This means that most of them rely on reflective and deliberative, deliberative thinking. Type one processes um, um, are much closer to the idea of that people in some situations tend to not rationally think about it, but react upon very spontaneous, automatic thoughts and feelings. Most dual process theories would assume that there is a primacy of affect in type one processing. Now, the ART of physical inactivity and exercise especially deals with relations between type one and type two reasoning. So most of the things I summarized under social cognitive theories of behavior change are still relevant within ART, but today we would like to introduce you to characteristics of our new theory, that is type one processes and their relation to ethic. Next slide, please. So this was my introductory part and I would like to uh, hand over to my colleague, Patty. Patty. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? 
and and let me also take this opportunity to thank SBM for this uh, 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 opportunity to present our, our thoughts. So um, to continue from what uh, Professor Brand was saying, um, a uh, central feature of art is that we um, recognize, the, of course, the importance of what we label as type two processes. In other words, art doesn't come as a new player on the field to say that everything you knew up to this point is wrong. Quite to the contrary, I think that uh, we recognize the central importance of reflective processes, but what we propose is to expand our conceptual framework and include processes that might be highly relevant and highly influential, but have not um, had the exposure um, that they deserve up to this point. So um, what I'm showing you here is an interesting, puzzling, and perhaps unique contrast. The study at the top is a survey of the U.S. adult population asking uh, individuals whether they recognize that physical inactivity is a health risk factor. And almost all U.S. adults say, yes, for me, physical inactivity is an important, very important, or the most important uh, health risk factor, 97%. The study at the bottom might be familiar to many of you, is a national survey of actual physical activity behavior using accelerometers, and 97% of uh, U.S. adults are below the recommended minimum recommended amount of physical activity to promote health. So we have this, this very puzzling and unique contrast between, yes, I know very well that I should be active and it's good for me, but I am uh, not active at the moment. Can we have the next slide, please? So this is now increasingly recognized by leaders in the field. Uh, the excerpt that I've highlighted here is from the 2012 uh, Lancet series on physical activity and health. The traditional public health approach based on evidence and exhortation has, to some extent, been unsuccessful so far. There are two diplomatic expressions here. One is to some extent. In fact, uh, the approach has been unsuccessful almost entirely. And so far, uh, really means for the past 40 years. So what we are trying to say is perhaps continuing down the path of only focusing on emphasizing the health benefits of physical activity and exercise might not be uh, uh, the solution to the problem of physical inactivity. Next slide, please. So uh, several years ago, I was uh, fascinated by a paper that was co-authored by uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Brand, because it highlighted this um, fascinating concept of a conflict between a reflective system that says exercise is good for me, I should be doing this, or I should be doing more of this, and then an impulsive system a non-rational, non-analytical, uh, non-reflecting, reflective system that says, yeah, but in the past when I've tried this, it didn't really feel that good or it was um, uh, painful or it was embarrassing or um, it was um, uh, uh, unpleasant. Next slide, please. So, we have come up with this uh, concept of affective valuation. And the concept of affective valuation implies that through experience, through multiple exposures to exercise or physical activity opportunities, uh, people develop this association of the concept of exercise or physical activity with a negative or a positive uh, valence. And that concept, that uh, affective valuation, we presume, is at the core of type 1 processes, consistent, as you heard before, with several other uh, dual process uh, models. As uh, Professor Brand will explain, we presume that art is what is known as a default interventionist dual process model in that it assumes that the first uh, um, thing that happens when the stimulus concept of exercise or physical activity pops into your mind 
is the function of the type one processes. And because of that, everything that uh, follows, the type two more reflective slower processes that follow could be colored by or could be influenced by uh, the type one uh, process that uh, preceded them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So our concept of affective valuation uh, is based on a, heavily on a notion that was developed earlier uh, by Antonio Damasio and his co-workers called the somatic marker hypothesis. I will not take the time now to um, go into this, but I wanted to bring this up if you're not familiar with it and highly recommend that you uh, read some of Damasio's work. So the idea is, again, that through multiple uh, prior experiences with a certain behavior, you develop this innate association, innate link between the behavior and a certain what Damasio calls feeling. Um, that then upon recall of that idea, of that behavior, you tend to have an immediate uh, reconfiguration uh, or um, reappearance of a softer, milder version of the feeling you had the last time uh, you engaged in that behavior. Next slide, next slide please. So a simplified version of what we presume is happening is that we have people who have perhaps remained uh, sedentary over uh, long periods of time. Uh, at some point, they, um, their bodies have changed, uh, perhaps profoundly. They um, attempt to engage in exercise. They derive negative affective experiences. They try that perhaps a few times. Uh, they start to form a negative affective valuation for the stimulus concept of exercise or physical activity. And that comes with a uh, negative disposition, a negative behavioral uh, tendency uh, that over time leads to avoidance and a perpetuation of a uh, vicious cycle. Next slide, please. So one of the problems that we have in disseminated this, disseminating these ideas is that if you look at exercise psychology and behavior change books, by and large, um, there is a predominance of the notion that exercise makes people feel better. Next slide. So I will go through a few fun slides to suggest that perhaps that idea is unwarranted. So this is from a national survey in the UK. The first question is uh, that was asked of uh, 2000 uh, uh, UK adults was whether they would engage in exercise if they knew that life, their life depended on it. And 62% said that they wouldn't. In the second question, they said, do you think that exercise is fun? 4% of adults in the UK said, yes, exercise is fun. Next slide. This is a, uh, an assortment of I hate to exercise or cardio sucks or similar merchandise. Next slide. This is from a uh, Time Magazine piece that made a lot of noise a few years back uh, because of its cover, The Myth About Exercise. Um, the idea that exercise is not going to help you lose weight. But for me, more interesting was the actual content of the article. So um, just to read a little bit and you will get the idea on Wednesday, a personal trainer will work me like a farm animal for an hour, sometimes to the point that I'm dizzy and abuse for which I pay as much as I spend on groceries in a week. Thursday is body wedge class, which involves another exercise contraption. This one, a large form wedge from which I will push myself up in various hateful ways for an hour. Friday will bring a 5.5 mile run, the extra half mile, my grueling expiation of any gastronomical indulgences during the week. So even though this is not hardcore science, I, it is important for me to show you how exercise is often portrayed in uh, popular media. Next slide. So... I, we think of it in a very broad sense, you know, the, the, the affective experiences that people derive from exercise in a very broad sense. 
Uh, the first picture here shows what I like to describe, how our kids come from the factory. This is the default configuration. They run around all day at very high intensity levels, and it's constantly with a smile on their faces. Next slide. At some point, things start to change, and we have to start now asking ourselves, how do we manage to wipe that smile off the kids' faces, because that is what happens over time. So this is one way we manage to do that, by imposing on them a concept, an idea of physical education that does not take into account pleasure and enjoyment. It's regimented, it is performance-focused, it is fitness-focused. Uh, we've started to attach issues of morality to the notion of exercise and fitness. Next slide, please. These are some very preliminary results from a national survey we, we just completed. And we asked adults, people who are now adults, about their experiences, pleasant and unpleasant, with exercise in the past, with, uh, sorry, physical education in the past. Um, the first two are examples of worst experiences, and the third is an example of uh, best experience. So my worst memory of P is having to run laps because of a certain student or two who decided to misbehave. I think uh, that should bring up memories for many. The second one, doing basketball, I failed to make a basket three times in a row, and this reduced my grade. And the last one, remember, is an example of a best experience, best memory. The day the doctor excused me from gym was the best day of my life. <clears throat> so think about those things. Next slide. Then we get into youth sport. Next slide. Where we have the massive problem of dropout. And this is from results from a systematic review on, on the reasons for dropout from youth sport. The number one is not fun. Number one reason for getting into youth sport in the first place is because of fun, but the number one reason of dropping out is not fun. Next slide. And then we get into adulthood where we really manage to screw things up by um, painting a picture of exercise as some type of punishment for gastronomical indulgences, uh, as the example showed before. Next slide. And as you will see, it is really very, very easy uh, for exercise to um, induce negative affective responses. On the left-hand side, you see the relationship between exercise intensity and the percentage of people who, see, who say that they feel better. You see how quickly that declines to almost zero. And on the right-hand side, it's the relationship between exercise intensity and the percentage of people who uh, feel progressively worse. And you can see how quickly uh, that uh, rises to almost 80%. Next slide. And then we have a recent example of HIT portrayed as the best exercise, but there's a caveat, it must hurt. Next slide. And this is a picture from uh, a year ago um, where a one of the um, staff for the Today Show uh, agreed to participate in a few weeks of high-intensity interval training. And the screen grab I'm showing here is the face that she made and the expression that she had the day that she finished the program. So if th this is how people feel, the relief after being done with exercise, we suggest that that is an example of a negative a type one uh, process. Next slide. So a poll question, next slide. We wanted to ask how often uh, you take affect into account in your behavior change uh, work, whether you measure it and whether you actively use um, affect-based or affect-focused intervention elements in your behavior change work. I think that's probably enough time.
Okay, so I'm very pleased to see that the uh, top response was that people indeed do consider affect as integral to their work. Nice job. Next. So let's put things together. Uh, after my very brief introduction into what type 1 and type 2 processes are, uh, you have now learned that affective valuation is in is a central construct to the art of physical inactivity and exercise, and that we uh, perceive affective valuation as a type one process. So I would uh, like to give you an outline of uh, ART itself. Next slide, please. Art of physical inactivity and exercise is embedded in a meta-theoretical framework which is related to the work of one uh, famous sociologist, Kurt Levine, uh, immigrated uh, to the United States from Germany in the 1950s, or earlier, actually. Um, and the framework is called, has been called uh, force field analysis. Um, art of physical inactivity and exercise uh, wants to explain thoughts and feelings, that is, the situation of a person in the very moment of, for example, physical inactivity. That means um, that art focuses one situation, for example, in the situation when somebody is sitting on a couch and uh, just in a situation in which someone is physical, inactive. Lewin's and uh, the framework here now assumes that if you want um, to uh, move from physical inactivity to a desired state in which you might be, for example, engaged in exercise, you have to take into account two forces which are termed like driving forces on the one hand side and restraining forces on the other side. What does that mean? Next slide, please. The idea is that a person in a state of physical inactivity might be driven by his or her beliefs by his or her values, by rational reflections um, that might help this person to change his or her behavior towards a desired state. Many of the variables you might know from so far social cognitive theories of behavior change act as driving forces. People have outcome expectancies about exercise behavior, or they expect um, to reach, uh, to meet certain values or goals with behavior change. But at the heart, at the core of art, is the idea that especially negative effective valuation of exercise could present a restraining force, which sometimes can be as important um, with regard to strength, as important as beliefs and values, which would help to move the individual from physical inactivity to the desired state. Next slide, please. So this is the situation which would uh, make it easier for someone to change his or her behavior meaning that driving forces need to be stronger than negative effective valuations of exercise. As you have heard, uh, um, um, as Professor Ekekakis have, have, has described, uh, many people, however, are assumed to have negative affective valuations, though. So art 
specifies how these two forces, driving forces and restraining forces, relate to each other. And it identifies or specifies situations in which behavior is rather driven by uh, affective valuation and type one processes and the situations in which type two processes, that means rational reflection, are more have more impact on behavior. Next slide, please. This is a summary of art. And I would like to explain you or say a few words, summarize a few things from the left to the right. Art, um, or imagine a person who is sitting on a couch in a state of physical inactivity. An exercise related stimulus then can be an internal stimulus, which is something like, I remember that the doctor told me that I should go exercising on a regular basis. An external related, an external exercise related stimulus could be uh, the advice by your wife or husband who tells you um, that you should get up now and, uh, and start exercising and do something. These exercise related stimuli uh, trigger the type one process in a form that automatic associations based on what you have learned previously, that is on encoded affect and cognition, that trigger automatic associations, which would result in an automatic, spontaneous, automatic affective valuation as defined uh, a few slides earlier. This automatic affective valuation is connected with an action impulse. An action impulse is like a behavioral urge, something which is, which, which may give you or which may drive you to action, to, in, to, to initiate action, but which will not always uh, result in behavior change immediately because under the condition that the individual has enough self-control to regulate his or her behavior deliberately, to reflect upon what he or she is doing at the moment, and to rationalize about, for example, consequences of behavior change, then the automatic effective valuation will be followed by a reflective processes, by reflective evaluation of the situation. So reflective evaluation contains many of the thoughts and feelings and patterns of thinking and feeling you might know. Like, for example, one's automatic effective valuation could be negative, but as you're as you are relaxed and have the time and the opportunity to think a bit, you might remember that you had already the intention to go exercising now, that you have uh, enough self-efficacy to believe that you can really do it. So then the action plans might be discrepant or different from the action impulse. So art of physical inactivity and exercise specifies situations in which type one processes have a pretty good chance to lead us to the desired state to help us changing our behavior. But it draws attention to the situation in which type two processes won't be as effective as they could be because self-control resources are depleted. This is a very brief outline and we invite you to read a lot more about uh, the theory in the article, uh, you, uh, or in the cited article. Next slide, please. I would like to just give you an impression about uh, how we, studied and how we do studies with regard to art. And uh, this is 
a study which is just out of the laboratory here in Potsdam. Most principally, we, we research the theory and have researched the theory in the following way. Uh, we try to measure, or we measure people's automatic effective valuation and their reflective evaluation with measurement technology that you might be familiar with uh, or not. Uh, we use implicit reaction time-based testing um, for uh, approximating uh, what we have termed to be the effective valuation of exercise. And we ask people with regard to their reflective evaluation. What we did in this experiment is that we randomized uh, participants to two conditions. Half of the participants uh, underwent manipulation in a way that we try to diminish to lower their self-control resources. Um, we tried to move them into a state of what has been termed ego depletion, a state in which people have not the energy to think a lot and not the motivation to rationalize. The other half of the participant was randomized to a control um, that is a condition in which they had a full um, self-regulatory uh, full self-regulatory resources. Next slide, please. After manipulation, um, we uh, observed people's or participants' decisions um, in, a, in, in a way that we observed um, which handle or dumbbell they would take uh, in order to do a quick exercise, to perform a quick exercise, and we wanted to operationalize their willingness to expose themselves to physical strain. Next slide, please. What you can see here, what we can see here is a rather complicated uh, 3D visualization of the data. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to explain or just summarize uh, the main findings here. What we find in experiments uh, in which participants um, have lowered self-regulatory uh, self resources is that Behavioral choices are predictable only in the condition of these lowered self-regulation resources. And what we can typically see here is that in a state of ego depletion, people tend to follow their action impulse. That is, depending on their effective valuation in the condition of ego depletion, people will act according to their automatic effective valuation. And only in situations in which they have the opportunity and the capacity to deliver it, in which their self-regulatory uh, regulatory resources are not depleted, they are able to override to transform possible negative automatic valuations into action plans that might lead them towards the desired states. Next slide, please. Patty. Okay, so I will uh, take over and uh, show you some examples of relationships uh, between affect, affective responses, and exercise or physical activity behavior, as well as some examples of intervention studies. Uh, we are a little bit behind on time, so I may not have the opportunity to show all of them to you, but the, the slide set will be available, uh, and it contains references to the, the studies that I uh, intended to show you. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to, to start with an example of um, an intervention, uh, masterful intervention uh, that tried to create this positive affective evaluation, a positive somatic marker. In this case, for a product, uh, and the ad that you see is actually decades old, and it shows uh, ahead of us. 
um, uh, some parts of the industry uh, were. And we're essentially playing catch up on uh, marketing methods and marketing uh, sophistication. So the, the example that you see here it tries generates a positive visceral reaction by this beautiful imagery uh, portrayal of, of freedom uh, and wide open spaces with a particular brand. Next slide. Absorb the, the contrast between the previous slide and this slide. This is an example of how the American Heart Association tries to convince you to be mindful of your heart health. And you will see a typical example of a type two process uh, approach, an overload, an overwhelming amount of very detailed and very specific and very technical information, clearly appealing or trying to appeal um, to your type two processes. Now, thankfully, in the last few years, next slide, we are seeing a slow progression to the types of approaches that I was um, uh, showing uh, earlier from industry, where we're trying to create this positive visceral association between uh, the idea of exercise and physical activity with positive affect. In this case, the word energy in big letters, Unfortunately, with a lot of smaller print that tries to still convey um, a lot of detailed technical information. Next slide. This is from a more recent uh, ad from the American Heart Association that now finally catches up entirely uh, with industry. And you will see no words, almost no appeal to type two processes just a pictorial association of the notion of the idea of movement and physical activity uh, with smiles and happiness and enjoyment. Next slide. So at this point, we have approximately 12 to 15 preliminary, not large, not uh, the strongest methodologically uh, studies that have shown an association between affective responses during a bout of exercise or physical activity and either concurrent or subsequent uh, exercise or physical activity behavior. The results are still weak, they're preliminary. The methodologies have a lot to be uh, criticized about, but it's a start, it's a beginning, and the results are promising. Next slide, please. So this is an off-sited uh, study that was done at uh, Brown University. So there was an initial uh, exercise uh, bout. Uh, people reported their affective responses at a moderate level of intensity and then reported their uh, physical activity behavior six and 12 months later. And you will see that each unit improvement in the scale that we use to measure affective responses was associated with uh, 29 and 21 additional minutes of at least moderate intensity physical activity uh, at six months and 15 additional minutes of physical activity at 12 months. Next slide. The previous study was done with adults. This study was done with adolescents. This is looking at uh, the association between whether the adolescents, when they exercised at a moderate intensity, felt better, the same, or worse, and their weekly amount of uh, objectively assessed uh, physical activity. So those who reported improvements in how they felt during moderate intensity exercise did on average 54 minutes of MVPA. Uh, those who reported uh, stable affective uh, responses, 46 minutes. Those who declined, 39 minutes. Next slide. So a few intervention uh, results. Next slide. So this is from a, a, a review that I did a few years ago, examining um, what happens to uh, the intensity that people choose when you allow them to choose 
without imposing any idea of, of how intense the exercise or physical activity should be. And I have created a bracket, as you see, uh, that's uh, marked as ACSM recommended range. And you will see that the vast majority of the cases in studies in which people were simply allowed to self-select their own intensity, they self-selected intensities within the ACSM recommended range. So it might not be necessary to then impose a specific recommendation on them. Uh, next slide. This is from a simulation in the lab in which we brought in women, adult women who had been sedentary for at least a year, but in many cases for several years. And we allowed them to have complete control over the uh, speed of the treadmill. That is shown in the red line. And you will see that they chose intensities, 84% uh, of maximal heart rate at the end of this 20 minute uh, walking bout, which is uh, plenty uh, of exercise to stimulate the cardiorespiratory system and uh, produce health and fitness adaptations. But then we brought them back a second time and we sped up without telling them we sped up the treadmill by an additional 10%. So imagine if they chose just two miles per hour, which was common, we sped things up to 2.2%. So it's almost imperceptible. But that led to an almost near max uh, intensity of 91% uh, percent of maximal heart rate. Next slide. And interestingly, when the women self-selected their intensity, they felt good throughout without any decline over the course of the bout. Whereas, next slide. When we sped things up by just 10%, they obtained a very different affective uh, experience from that whole process. I think I'm going to uh, stop at this point. I have a few more examples, but uh, we were a little behind on time, and I do want to allow as much time as possible uh, for questions uh, from all of you. So thank you again for, for the opportunity to share our ideas. Thank you very much, Patty and Ralph. This is Bethany Kwan. Um, I'll be moderating the question portion of the webinar today. Uh, so if anyone has questions, please pose them in the question box and I can answer them or pose them. All right. So it looks like we have a, a question from John Anderson saying, are you aware of any online programs one might do um, a master's program in, in this subject to learn more about how to, how to incorporate this work into one's own activities? So I, I can uh, uh, take that from the, the, the US side. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, master's programs or online master's programs. One thing we need to emphasize and highlight is the recency of the kinds of ideas that we are proposing. So usually to get to the point of formulating an educational curriculum, you need a certain amount of time or five or 10 years for the ideas to disseminate into journals and then into textbooks and uh, formulate a knowledge base that is sufficient to sustain an educational curriculum. So we're not quite at that point yet. Uh, the ideas we're sharing are quite, quite recent um, in the literature. Um, and then Patty, as you anticipated, um, a question is, would you suggest that your proposed theory can apply to other health behaviors like dieting? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, uh, Bethany and I are, are smiling because we had that uh, conversation over email yesterday. So um, the, the literature on uh, eating behaviors is uh, larger than the literature on exercise and physical activity behavior. And uh, the, the notion that eating behavior is driven in part by what they call hedonic factors that uh, interact uh, with rational thinking. That idea has been around in the literature on eating behaviors for quite a while. So they're slightly, in fact, um, ahead of um, the physical activity and exercise literature uh, in that regard. So the short answer is yes, the, the, pr the principal idea of the dual process framework definitely applies to other health behaviors as well.
Yeah. Few words from my side on that in addition. Um, um, one, one difference between the literature or studies related to dual process modeling uh, in the uh, eating diet domain uh, and uh, the art we propose here is that art is uh, an inherently exercise psychological account and approach in a way that uh, we think that exercise uh, delivers physical feelings, uh, comes with physical strain, which gives you a characteristic experience of a characteristic and more significant uh, intensity uh, feelings, which is hardly comparable to the situation in which you like uh, eat something you like or or yes eat, eat something. So this this might be uh, it might be hard to directly apply hypotheses derived from the art of physical inactivity and exercise to uh, this other domain. But the more general framework of dual process theorizing is applicable to this domain, of course, too. And you will find several articles which have been published on dieting, eating behavior in the past, let's say, 10 years, not more, because dual processing is an idea which has appeared only recently uh, in literature regarding health behaviors. And, and the one uh, subfield of health psychology that is way ahead of all the others is addictions, by the way, because that's where they, they, they have been aware of the contrast between type 1 and type 2 processes for a much longer time than the rest of us. Um, so I see a couple of people have more have posed more than one question, but to give everybody a little bit of an audience, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, so Paul Branscombe asks, um, it seems like you're treating physical inactivity and physical activity as two sides of the same coin. Have you considered treating them as two separate behaviors, though they might have different underlying forces? Hey, will you start? I think I'll let you take that one. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Regard it from uh, published literature on, on physical inactivity and exercise. Uh, it has been proposed that these two behaviors are different. And the reason why colleagues propose that these two behaviors uh, might be different were that uh, theories from uh, social cognitive theorizing were not able or were suboptimal in explaining why people stay physically inactive. For example, if you're sitting on a couch or a sofa, uh, it is not reasonable to assume that people have the intention to remain sitting and remain in a state of physical inactivity. It just happens. It is there. So this was the reason why some colleagues uh, suggested that those two behaviors uh, should be treated separately. Uh, now, the idea from or with art of physical inactivity and exercise is that indeed these two behaviors are two sides of the same metal. This means um, if you assume that there are, that effective valuation uh, represents sort of a restraining force to the driving forces, for example, intentions to change one's behavior on the other side, and that there is a not an imbalance, but sort of a steady state between driving and uh, restraining forces, then indeed you would assume that the same theory, art of physical inactivity and exercise, can be used to explain why people remain in their present state of physical inactivity, whilst others manage to change their behavior. So indeed, this theory, art 
tries to explain both sides of this metal and exceeds um, or might go further than other theories in the field so far with regard to this aspect. So we are um, at the end of our hour. Um, Patty and Ralph, are you okay sticking around for a little bit longer to answer a couple more questions? No, absolutely. We are definitely available. Okay. Yes, so thanks. Let's keep going. Um, so let's see. Um, so Andy Daly Smith um, says, great presentation. Does exercise damage the physical activity brand if individuals engage in exercise and have negative, negative affect? So if exercise is branded as physical activity and therefore we talk about being physically active, so is there sort of an association in the terminology that we're using? Can I uh, start, Ralph? So, of course, you know, it's not exercise in general. I, I would hesitate to say that exercise hurts the physical activity brand. But I can uh, definitely uh, see the point in saying that certain variations of exercise or certain portrayals of exercise uh, hurt the physical activity brand. So one giant problem that we have had as a field uh, or a subfield of health promotion is that we have never seriously considered the marketing aspects uh, of our messaging. Uh, of our physical activity recommendations, of our exercise um, uh, prescriptions. So to a large extent, a lot of the damage, unfortunately, doesn't come from uh, outside sources. So, you know, gyms or uh, chains of fitness facilities or that sort of thing. Uh, in our case, a lot of the damage and uh, the missteps in the marketing uh process or uh, approach are what I call endogenous. They come from within. It's uh, when we have uh, people speaking off script uh, from within the field and portraying their own beliefs, uh, their own passions, their own um, unique interpretations or unique interests, um, and capturing the attention of the media and creating a lot of, um, of media noise and then portraying um, notions or versions of exercise that take us away uh, from our effort to build that very difficult <laughs> to build association between exercise or physical activity and positive affect. I, I showed some examples today and I had to cut, of course, a lot uh, more uh, where our portrayals of exercise um, intentionally or inadvertently create that uh, association with negativity or with pain, with suffering. Um, and, and that definitely, I think, is an inhibitory uh, force. You want to add to that, Ralph? No. Okay. Um, so let's see, there are some questions here uh, about how long it takes to change your affective evaluation. So how long would you need to be exposed to images like the Marlboro ad for it to modify our automatic affective evaluation? So Ralph, has done, Ralph has done an image-based, uh, computer-based uh, proof of concept study, so I'll let him take that. Thank you. Yes, uh, let me... Let me first admit, very good question. <laughs> uh, the point is, we don't know. We don't know. We have, we have not the empirical data yet to give you definite answer on that. But I can give you an impression about the studies we had so far and an impression about how I evaluate literature on that, on that, uh, on that case. Um, first of all, uh, I think there are a few studies uh, which have successfully shown that uh, the, the idea that people associate feelings during exercise or, or associate feelings um, with, with 
um, with, with, with behaviors is a, a good explanation how effective valuation uh, develops. So what we can show in the lab is that if you, if you uh, manage to loosen these associations between, for example, exercise and negative affect, that this principle is successful in altering people's effective valuations. Um, however, I am not aware of a single empirical trial in which uh, one this this general rule uh, has been empirically tested. But I would suppose as feelings during, for example, high intensity exercise are massive, that negative affect might be significant in the state of high intensity exercising. It is not easy to uh, cut this association within a few sessions. This means that uh, we would hypothesize that a lot of repetition, that repeated association of positive feelings and exercising will be necessary uh, until the former or former associations between negative affect and exercise are loosened, actually. So if I can add a, a very quick comment on that. So the, the, the study, and there are, there are actually a, a couple more than the one that um, Ralph has done. So you can demonstrate uh, using a computer-based approach that the uh, implicit association between exercise and, and, uh, and negative or negative uh, reactions um, can be changed. But that is only a proof of concept demonstration because this is not applicable to real life. In real life, you know, when you've exposed yourself to negative affective responses over a period of years, uh, and by negative affective responses, I don't, I don't just mean uh, high intensity. I also mean embarrassment and guilt and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, if, if you have years of that, then you can safely assume that they have built a pretty solidified negative association. And that's what Ralph was talking about. So to, to break down, to loosen that association in real life, um, if it took 10 years to build a negative association, you can imagine that it will probably take years of corrective action um, to start uh, for things to start to move in the opposite direction. Thank you. So there's a, a couple of questions here um, about the uh, considering the role of affective response to exercise in the context of uh, addressing overweight and obesity, and a similar one about how it, there, there's relationships uh, with fit, with substance abuse. So can you talk about kind of how Physical activity affective response relates to those other considerations? So I think I can take the obesity one. Um, this is an area that I, I, I have a great interest in. Um, so physical activity levels in individuals with obesity are extremely low. And, and in the vast majority of the cases, they're essentially zero. So this is a, an, an astounding uh, phenomenon, and we have to start wondering why. And it, it turns out that obesity changes the exercise and physical activity experience in profound ways. And it becomes, I'm, I'm very sorry to say, nearly impossible for an individual with especially class 2, class 3 obesity to derive uh, positive affective experiences uh, from exercise. This is the main reason why prevention is, is so important, uh, prevention of childhood obesity. Because once obesity sets in, um, the, the, the job of exercise professionals to find options for physical activity and exercise that are pleasant 
not just tolerable, but pleasant, that job becomes nearly impossible. So I, I don't have good solutions uh, to propose, uh, uh, sadly. Uh, what I can say is that at a minimum, we need to start breaking down that notion that um, displeasure during exercise is some sort of a good sign or uh, entirely unavoidable. We, we should start being sensitive to, to the idea that if uh, we have an obese client uh, who is starting something, um, we need to constantly monitor and be constantly mindful and constantly sensitive to the issue of physical discomfort and pain and try our hardest to exhaust any opportunity we have to lessen the discomfort and if possible at all to uh, improve the affective experience. So can you be a little more specific about the substance abuse question? Because I, I wasn't clear exactly what the point of the question was. Yes, yeah, so um, so it says, have you looked at how the art of physical act inactivity and exercise can be applied to those who are in recovery from substance use to encourage physical activity in this population? It's an excellent question. Ralph, do you have uh, something? Just hypotheses, not <clears throat> nothing, nothing evidenced. We'll take your hypotheses, Ralph. <laughs> well, <laughs> <clears throat> well, with 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 regards to uh, exercise or exercise behavior, I think uh, that's that's. The, the, the idea uh, suggested by art are applicable to that situation to to people uh, with 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 uh, addiction uh, too, but actually we don't, we don't know whether those people might uh, experience uh, things differently during exercise, how their feelings might feel actually. And so it's pure speculation um, whether whether things are exactly the same. I would say it's a good guess, but um, I'm I have no evidence for that feeling, for my feeling there. All right. Well it sounds like Brianna is doing some research on that. So we'll see what she comes up with. Um, let's see, maybe we can find, do one more question here. I know we're quite a bit over time. Um, you've answered a lot of these. Let's see. Okay. So how about we'll end with what might be a simple question. Um, so is affective valuation the same principle as value expectancy when referring to theory? Are those the same no. thing? No, no, it is not. Uh, because um, affective valuation, uh, and as suggested by Art, is a type one process. This means that it is uh, an automatic, uh, low or minimum effort mental process uh, of thought and feeling. Uh, which would not require any self-control resources. And that's different with the other construct. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for staying 15 minutes over to answer these wonderful questions. These are probably the best questions we've had at a, at a um, TTB CI SIG seminar. So this was great. Thank you, everybody, for attending um, thanks, Jackie and Anne, and especially to Patty and Ralph for your um, for your willingness to present today and share your hypotheses. And Thank Dave. you so much for the opportunity. Thank you to SPM. Thank you for the wonderful attendees and their questions, and and to all of you who helped coordinate. Thank you. Thanks.